morning. My name is Vince Faney. I'm the new producer of the show, Vinsanity Unplugged, in search of game changers. My job and my mission is to go out into the community and find people in various walks of life, whether they're athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, researchers, teachers, and even candidates for public office, people who are promising to be game changers, not merely doing their job as they were taught, but being innovative and uh, ahead of the curve. So we got an exciting race this year here in Lane County. Uh, a lot of people, the, the, the rumor is that they're, uh, these guys are game changers, they're ahead of the curve, and yet they, and they, will, they, they are um, basically trying to solve many of the same issues. The question is, how are they going to go about the issues? And today we have Kevin Matthews who's going to go about it in his own way and he's going to explain to you what he's going to do. Kevin, welcome. Good morning. Morning. So tell us a little about yourself. Well, I'm a Lane County native, um, worked as a ranch hand, a blacksmith, an educator, and an entrepreneur. Um, my mom is a social worker, mm -hmm. and my dad is a physicist. Wow. Physicist. And I think uh, some, of the, some of what I bring to problem solving comes from having had a strong grounding for my folks mm -hmm. in both that human side mm -hmm. and in kind of the, the technical yeah. side. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think that when we can bring those things together, um, we've got, got a chance to make progress. Sounds like a good marriage between everything. So, so yeah, and so um, I understand also that you've got degrees in like uh, architecture and... and uh, I have an environmental planning degree okay. uh, from UC Santa Cruz mm -hmm. and a Master of Architecture degree from UC Berkeley. Wow, so that's a lot of math and technical and art and everything, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a combination. You know, I, I, I love to work with my hands mm -hmm. and I love to work with my head mm -hmm. and I... I did an apprenticeship in blacksmithing yeah. and worked my way through college, both, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. I drove a bean harvester for right. Del Monte out of Salem, mm -hmm. um, and, and at a certain point, you know, I felt like I, I was looking for a way to have a credential that uh. would allow me to move forward. And it seemed at that point like architecture was a uh, area that, at its best, combines people who who live in and around buildings, mm -hmm. and the the way you build buildings, mm -hmm. and the expression of the 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 cultural expression of what the buildings look like mm -hmm. and how they're built and how all that comes together for the good of people. Right. Um, I got pretty inspired about that. And okay. That got me through architecture school anyway. Okay. And then where'd you go after uh, school, after you got all this massive education? <laughs> what did you do? I, I worked, while I was in school was when um, the first generation of kind of heavy duty computer based design and drafting systems were coming along. Mm -hmm. So. I became one of the teachers of those things as a graduate student, mm -hmm. which led to being a consultant to architecture firms mm -hmm. in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and then I became kind of an in-house consultant for a big um, big physics research project called oh. the Superconducting Super Collider, wow. which took me to Texas for a while. And and it took me a little bit out of architecture, mm -hmm. um, but while I was in Texas, I was still um, going to conferences and trying to stay in touch with some of the things we'd been doing mm -hmm. about architectural education and how to use um, the emerging computer tools mm -hmm. to make communication about buildings more vivid mm -hmm. and more accurate, more real. That helps both education mm -hmm. and then also clients and communities understanding what buildings are about before they get built. Okay. So anyway, I was, I was staying in touch with that stuff and that really led me to being recruited to come teach at the University of Oregon. Oh, wow. Which was like a dream come true for me. So you had headhunters seeking you out, <laughs> well, saying come to U of O. <laughs> I met a senior faculty person at a, at a conference and we really hit it off and then apparently, they tell me, came back here and told the department head, here's this whippersnapper we should try to yeah. get on board here. So yeah. while I was at teaching at the university, I continued 
working on some of my own ideas mm -hmm. in the design of how people interact with computers in three dimensions, mm -hmm. because architecture is very three dimensional, yes. despite only having a two dimensional computer screen. Right. Uh, really, really stuff that was like, how do you make the Star Trek holodeck something that you can look into in a window and build in the right, holodeck? Right, that sounds cool. And that turned into a software company. And you that you designed a software that company. That turned into my, my software company. Okay. Yep. And and that company went through, you know, several evolutions as any high tech company has to. Mm -hmm. I ran that company for over twenty years. It was wow. my I I switched from the university to being a private entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And and for over twenty years that was my livelihood and wow. um, provided provided the foundation for Several kids who grew up and mm -hmm. and found spouses and started families. You know, so I had the I had the both the responsibility and the satisfaction of being an employer to a a team of people. Right. And seeing all that take place. Wow. You know, I, I got to say, I'm impressed. Like I, so many different types of people impress me. Like when you get somebody who's got a massive education, then they get out and they they struggle, and they maybe they get a job with one company and they they find their niche and they work hard. And that's pretty impressive. Then you get other people who become teach at a university and they're high up in the academic towers and that's pretty impressive. But if they were to get out of school, they, they struggle, you know. I'm pretty intrigued and impressed with people who kind of like able to cross those different areas and then, you know, kind of go out and innovative, you know, be innovative and create your own, your own business, your own innovative stuff, you know. And uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by people like that. And that's, that's why, like, wow, you have all these things that you're going to bring together. So, here you are running for office. Yeah, how are you going to take all that stuff? What are you going to do? And that's that's maybe I don't know if you call that a, a third branch, but it's another 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 realm that, mm -hmm. of course, in the early days of starting my company and developing the first couple generations of the software, mm -hmm. learn getting onto the internet just as it was getting started. You mm -hmm. know, I was working 60, 80 hours a week, and I was not many more involved in the community than just a regular voter. Right. Um, but I actually had, you know, I also worked as a union organizer okay. when I was in, in college, and I've always been interested in government and decision making, mm -hmm. especially consensus decision making, mm -hmm. which we'll probably get back to at some point. Sure. And so as my company kind of got you know, stabilized and, and up to a point where it didn't require constant startup energy, I was able to get more involved in the local community. At this yeah. point, for close to 20 years, I've been volunteering as a community advocate and community leader mm -hmm. in different areas and different topics around Lane County, South Eugene, West Eugene. What are some of the most uh, uh, productive, enjoyable uh, things that you worked in? Well, one example uh, in in uh, the neighborhood of South Eugene, mm -hmm. Southeast Neighbors. I was the locally elected neighborhood leader there for 12 years. Okay, and I was sort of selected internally as to be kind of the figurehead for a t really great team of people who were working to preserve a particular couple of patches of the headwaters of Amazon Creek. Oh, okay. And the community had already made big investments in the Spencer Butte Regional Park mm -hmm. and some other protected land kind of up on the shoulders of Spencer mm -hmm. Butte. And then the Amazon Creek Greenway that goes through town. Okay. And then, and then l after the Greenway had been protected, the West Eugene wetlands were, were collected. It was kind of a rescue of a lot of... Uh, landowners, even land speculators, because that had been planned as the ex industrial expansion area mm -hmm. for Eugene, but then they found out that it was wetlands. laced with wetlands yeah, all over. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a big gradual buy, willing seller buyout, mm -hmm. um, very, a re, you know, a win-win that was a, saved a huge amount of rare wetlands for the mm -hmm. environment, and also got a bunch of landowners, made them whole 
despite having bought the wrong land, you know? What do you mean by make them whole? Well, they bought the wrong land? They bought the wrong okay, land, you know? And, okay. And uh, thinking that, thinking that, you know, the, a lot of times the way you, the way somebody makes money in real estate, big money, mm -hmm. is one way to make big money is to buy land that's at a certain low price mm -hmm. because it seems to not be developable. Mm -hmm. And then to get the rules changed so that it is developable, at which point its price goes way up. Mm -hmm. And that delta in the price is what makes big money. Okay. And that's one of the reasons that, oh. that land speculators are always pushing on the development rules. Ah. There's some who just, you know, you build a house and you make, you have a markup on building the house and you mm -hmm. make money building the house. You can, that's a, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to complain about how anybody makes a living. Sure. But, but I do think there's a line between the people who work within the established framework of the rules and provide services and make money doing that. Right. And people who make big money by getting the rules changed in their favor. So, yeah, are you saying, um, let me get this clear. I dabbled in real estate a bit, but I, it, the level I did it was not rocket science. So, um, are you saying that sometimes developers will look at a property that looks all swampy and mucky and maybe low cost, and then they go, okay, this is low cost. I'm getting it for next to nothing or pennies on the dollar. We'll change the rules and allocate this wetlands to some other area, yep. and therefore it's going to be worth a lot more. I'm going to make a killing even if I don't build anything on it. So that's how that works? That's one way that it can work. Okay. A, a, classic, a classic example in Oregon, because we have urban growth boundaries yeah. around our metropolitan areas so that sprawl doesn't just eat up the rural countryside. Right. Um, that means that, that the land inside the urban growth boundary is priced as developable land, planned mm -hmm. and served, you know, with water and power mm -hmm. and so on, and priced. The land right outside the urban growth boundary, which is, you know, sort of an imaginary line that we've just drawn by agreement, right. the land right outside m might have a much lower value because it would just be s usable as farm or forest land. Right, okay. And as a, as a society in Oregon, we've made the choice that we believe in protecting farmland right and we believe in protecting forest land and not having the competition for housing development mm -hmm. drive up the prices of those because you can't afford to farm if the value of your land and the property taxes on your land oh, yeah. are as if it had a subdivision on it right you know? so so but if you buy that land that's farmland or forest land and then you manage to get the urban growth boundary moved to the other side of it, that land could double or more in value. Oh, okay. So some of the, some of the political arguments that we have about the urban growth boundary and whether to expand it or not, mm -hmm. it gets argued in terms of ideology or, or different specific points, but sometimes in the background, there's money, big money at okay. stake. So uh, are you for more for like keeping everything within the urban boundaries and building up? Or uh, what, you, what, your, what, you, what would you like to see? Yeah, I spent a lot of time in the trenches of Eugene, especially Eugene, some also Springfield, but especially Eugene's um, series of citizen advisory committees. Um, if outside government was a Jobs and Land Use Roundtable. Mm -hmm. And then there was something that was called ECLA, the Gene Comprehensive Lands Assessment. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, the Envision Eugene mm -hmm. Community Resource Group. And then a subset of that carried on as the Envision Eugene Technical Resource Group. Right. You know, both those last ones got city awards for the amount of in service that went into them and the city's appreciation of the work. I participated in all four of those, as well as various other communities. God. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> real, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. And you working and having raising a family and breeding horses. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, but I do believe I I love this community. Mm -hmm. I love the countryside. I love the cities, mm -hmm. and and I I have the background that allows me to to work with the facts. Mm -hmm. And and I really, I really believe in 
working together with people mm -hmm. and helping people work together with each other mm -hmm. to find win-win solutions. You couldn't have built a company if that wasn't true, I would imagine. It's finding, building win-win yeah, solutions. Yeah. That's, that's my approach mm -hmm. to how you attract an investor, yeah. how you attract a customer. Um, it's not, here's some quick razzle-dazzle and give me your money and, right. and you know, we're out the door before you find out what you bought. No, right. it's like, you know, here's education about it, here's what you can do about it, here's a community, you know, we, we were, my company was a pioneer in online communities and discussion cool. forums. Wow. Um, and all the different parts of a culture, and I've really been, i really been, always been interested in the whole picture, and one of the reasons I moved from academia to private industry mm -hmm. was, uh, academia is a fairly narrow slice. It's a mm -hmm. nice deep slice, mm -hmm. but it's pretty narrow. It's got a lot of sideboards on it, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit hands off from the real world. You know, I want to get my hands in and get messy and try to right. do stuff that really sticks. Mm -hmm. And and then also over the course of trying different things and working on different things, I've become more and more more and more interested in the human side of things. Right. And the, the technical tools, I'm a big believer in technical tools. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of realized not too long ago, I was thinking about my, my dad and his dad, and I realized that I'm the, I'm the third generation in our line that has a US patent in our name. Oh, nice. <laughs> kind of a little trivia. Yeah. Each but of you have your own patents. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, in totally different areas, you know, okay. totally different. But, but there's a sort of a curiosity, you know, and mm -hmm. a tinkering. And, that's, and I think that's a very American yeah. kind of thing that, that I'm proud to participate in. Nonetheless, the human side of things, you know, every, every has always has seemed to be, I've learned more and more about how fundamental the human side is mm -hmm. relative to the technical side. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at a place in our society now, uh, there's a famous quote from Albert Einstein, um, what we have is a perfection of means and a confusion of ends. Uh -huh. So we have all this industry, we have all this technology, um, and, and what we're trying to do with it is sometimes garbled. Yeah. And the fact that we're living on our planet so unsustainably, yeah. and the, the rising costs on every level, including economic costs of, of living unsustainably, that's the evidence that our ends are garbled. Mm -hmm. and why is that, you think? Why, why is, how do we get in this situation? <laughs> I, I don't know. I did, I, you know. Well, a simple yeah. answer. Okay. A simple answer sure. would be that the systems we've built around economics have elevated money as an abstract measurement of value, mm -hmm. of success, mm -hmm. um, of of worth, right? And we only include certain kind of arbitrary things mm -hmm. in that money quality. So we don't include motherhood mm. in the value of money. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we have if we have a disaster, you know, suppose we have a, a completely human-made disaster. Suppose a, a skyscraper is built, right? And the skyscraper collapses because it was built wrong, mm -hmm. and it gets rebuilt. Well, when we calculate our gross domestic product, the value of all the work you know that's done in our country, mm -hmm. motherhood doesn't count for anything. But the dem the cleaning up the collapsed skyscraper and building it over again, each of those counts as more more value. Right. Even though from a 30,000 foot view, you could say, well, motherhood is fundamentally important. Yeah. And, and the building collapsing and cleaning up after it, that's waste, yeah. not added value. Yeah. So, and then, then, you, then you get into the, the, 
the mechanisms around how money works with all the regulations and corporations that have been given immortality that they were never originally designed to have. Right. And now with the Citizens United decision on campaign financing, corporations have been given kind of unlimited free speech. Yeah. So, so you have these corporate persons that also have limited liability. So the actual human beings who own them are not directly accountable. Right, that's, that's wrong. So you have, yeah. a bre you have a lack of accountability, and you have ex super rights, you know, the rights of you know, and a being that could go on and on and on, right. more than a person. Um, that's all been built around making the money system work. Right. And, and you know, capitalism has given us amazing things. Yeah, it's just a tool, though. I mean, it can be overused. Money and, is uh, a tool. Capitalism is tool. like a tool methodology. Met yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's time to, to think better um, about how to work toward our common long-term needs and dreams and, right. you know, while protecting individual rights and prerogatives and freedoms. Okay. And so how are you going to go about all this? Because I, I, I hear from uh, uh, so many people that every one of the candidates, they all want to strive, they list the same issues, but you're going to go about it differently. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing that. Yeah. Well, and, and how do you... And, and how do you distinguish between candidates who come sit and talk in front of a camera and, and say, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and we can all say the same things. Right, and, right. Um, you look at somebody's history, how they performed in the past, and if they, you don't really see it, then maybe they, they weren't able to perform in the way they wanted because they have to deal with other people or maybe block in their way. Uh, so, maybe, you know, basically, uh, some people say, well, I want to improve the economy, I want to improve the environment. And this other person says the same thing, but mm -hmm. you may say, well, this is my game plan. Here's the flow chart I yep. made. Here's the thing this person says, well, I don't have a flow chart. And, and so. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, 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 I, and I do hope that, uh, that voters can, can look at my track record mm -hmm. from, from, you know, I, I start, I think I never quite finished the punchline of that story about the Amazon, Amazon Creek, okay, and the the, the headwaters on Spencer View and right. out to the West Eugene Wetlands, right? And we talked about the West Eugene Wetlands, yeah. But what what I what I worked with with what I worked on with a great group of fellow citizens in South Eugene was trying to protect a couple of parcels, mm -hmm. um, a 38 acre piece and a 26 or 27 acre piece mm -hmm. that were the missing link to be able to have the water connected and a wildlife ha corridor that mm -hmm. connected and a recreation corridor mm -hmm. that connected. And that, that piece that we called the Amazon Headwaters Keystone, we worked for 15 years to ultimately result in having it be purchased on a willing seller basis. On a what basis? Willing seller. Okay. You know, so, sure. so the owner finally agreed to sell it at fair market value, and a public-private partnership bought it, and now it's part of the city park system. So nobody had to force like intimate domain or anything right. like that. Wow, that's that's right. a win-win. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and that there, you know, obviously over the course of 15 years, there was a lo there was a long story there, and there were several applications submitted to the city to try to develop that property. Okay. There were some real, real problems with that because different branches of Amazon Creek went through the property and cut it into little pieces, and there really was no place to put the road through without wiping out part of the creek. So, right. it had serious the same things. So, you see, this is not uncommon that a piece of land that has really high environmental value mm -hmm. is actually a lousy piece of land to develop. Right. You know, a swamp land or it, wetlands, it, that's a lousy piece of land to develop. It's a lot more work and materials and everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, at, but it's also, and foundations have problems, all kinds of things like that. At the same time, it's a real um, node of, of biodiversity. And it's very, you know, the water is always important to wildlife. Yeah. Especially, you know, in any area. But in our area, we have these really dry summers. Mm -hmm. So we have, 
w lots of water <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. But the water restricts to certain places, and the wildlife has to be able to move in and out. Yeah. And the landscape kind of breathes that way. So that was an example. A another example, um, in actually in West Eugene, you know, it was a community controversy in Lane County for what was it? You know, 30 or 40 years. The idea of building a parkway around West 11th, okay. a highway shortcut, oh, right. you know, sort of toward Venita. Right, right. Um, called the West Eugene Parkway or right. the WEP. Yeah. And and that went back and forth and back and forth, and the community was narrowly divided on it. And uh, ODOT spent a couple million dollars or more on starting to buy pieces of land and doing engineering studies and so on. And then the city of Eugene, with the political pendulum, said no. And, and at that point, that created the context where people on all sides of the issue sort of felt equally frustrated and equally stymied. And unfortunately, sometimes, not always, but sometimes that's what it takes mm -hmm. to get people to lower their guard mm -hmm. and stop just doing the tug of war, my side, my side, my side, coil up the rope and sit around it in a circle metaphorically and, 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 and look for win-wins together. Okay. And we got together a group of uh, 25 or 30 community leaders from different sectors and different mm -hmm. political sides and different ideologies. Um, you know, Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. developers, environmentalists, um, big shots and regular folks, mm -hmm. triangulating, um, and, and met intensively over the course of a couple of years. Right. And in the end, we had a 43-page detailed new vision for West Eugene that we had 100% consensus on. Wow. And included in that consensus was Faye Stewart, who I ran against for county commissioner okay. four years ago. Okay. This was this was before that. Right. But you know, so that's an example. And and I was one of the, I was one of the um, people on the coordinating committee mm -hmm. who paid a lot of attention to our working process and how we could, over the course of two years, move from building a set of shared facts. Right. If you have, if you can agree about the facts of the situation, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times you're, you're halfway to finding a win-win solution. Right. And in, in politics today, seems like on controversial issues, people disagree about the facts most of the time. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and by disagreeing about the facts, it sets up a situation where as a politician, somebody can just argue forever and fight for their side and ask for contributions and stay in office and perpetuate the conflict. Right. And there's kind of a, a, a system, a self-reinforcing system of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> that works that way. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of why business as usual is broken. Right. Um, so. But when you bring facts into the situation and when you have a, an interactive society who, um, who are, is basically uh, encouraged to be empowered to put pressure and keep transparency on their uh, their leaders yeah. or their servants, civil servants, uh, then you have, um, you know, say, dude, you know, you're going against facts. You're going against, mm -hmm. so, you know, so maybe hopefully that could help people who are really into, like, let's keep, let's just, it's the facts. Let's yeah. just keep focused on the facts. Yeah. So hopefully that will happen. It, it, that, that can happen sometimes, but, but because the people are kind of divided up into different camps on different issues, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think there's tremendous value and potential in the internet and the web and mm -hmm. social media for people to communicate at a grassroots level. Right. For conversations like this to get out to people mm -hmm. that we don't have to care about whether it's going to make money for somebody who owns a TV station. Right. YouTube will let us get this conversation to people. Right. There's great stuff there. But we also know that, that the way people self-select what they yeah. view creates echo chambers. And that's always, you know, there's always been, uh, there have always been people dividing into camps. Mm -hmm. that, so, 
so a lot, sometimes in order to get people to really agree on the facts, you have to have people really sit down and talk face to face. Mm -hmm. You have to build enough trust to take turns mm -hmm. listening, take turns speaking, and I'll put my facts out, I'll say why I think they're facts, you maybe just listen. Then you put your facts out, you tell me why you think they're facts, I'll just listen. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I heard uh, from you, your facts and why I hear you believing those facts. You tell me what you think I, you heard me saying about my facts and what I believe those facts are. And maybe we just let it rest there for a while and we go on to talking about in the case of East Lane County, this mm -hmm. amazing rural landscape of the Cascade foothills up to the Three Sisters, mm -hmm. down to the Willamette River and mm -hmm. the Fertile Valley. When I talk with anybody in East Lane County about what we would want for our grandkids 20, 30 years ago, I don't know that I've talked to anybody who's had any other vision than this is a beautiful place, mm -hmm. The ability to go out and commune with nature, hunt and fish, find a place that's quiet and you can be alone, mm -hmm. find a place that, that's active and you can careen down a mountainside. Right. You know, the ability to do all those stuff that we get from having an intact countryside is precious. Oh yeah. And so so we taught so whether we're Republicans or Democrats or live in a big house on the Mackenzie, or, or we live in a little house in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, we value that together. And so when we talk about our long range vision and what we want, what's gonna be good for the community, for our children, we get away from like, what do I need to pay my mortgage next month? You know, mm -hmm. what do I need to achieve my next personal goal? Mm -hmm. Get out of that ego and narcissism and central you know self-centeredness and, and look at the big picture we find tremendous commonality and right. and that comes out on, on issue after issue now so you you know you, you build the build the sense of through that through talking the right way mm -hmm. you can build trust to the point where you really can hear and you can start to say you know you know I didn't realize I didn't realize what that developer, money bags, country club family, I didn't realize how much they feel like they put their fortune at risk to build things in this community. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much they feel despised by regular folks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe some of that's jealousy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't do any good for me to despise them. And if I want to get to a win-win solution that meets my needs, I better treat them with the same respect I want them to treat me. Right. You know, and we find we you find that people can move together, move forward together. Now, the way our government is set up doesn't help that. And a lot of the stuff that I think I've learned through the experiences of you know being an activist and working consensus, decision making, and being a community advocate for, for you know, the last 20 odd years, the ways that we can get things done outside of government. Mm -hmm. and so, so that consensus vision for West Eugene, we involved elected officials, mm -hmm. but that, was, that conversation was not a county board meeting. It was not a city council meeting. It was not a government advisory committee meeting. Who was it? It was just a bunch of people getting together talking and that agreed that to do that. You felt that was in a way maybe more productive? or It, ca it can be more productive because because the, well, this is pretty down in the weeds, but, but mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think there are two reasons it can be more productive. First of all, we've set up a whole bunch of rules to try to force fairness onto the government system. Okay. that make it very inflexible. Second, our whole system of democracy 
is based on a binary system. So, so to get a historical perspective, okay. um, you know, before the American Revolution, we had monopolar government. We had a hereditary or might makes right based, you know, they didn't really call it dictatorial, but aristocratic dictatorial the monarchies? monarchy. Right. One person in charge. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that one person in charge would be brilliant and big hearted, mm -hmm. and they could do some pretty great stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, after a few generations of random breeding, yeah. you get somebody in there <laughs> who was, <laughs> yeah, who was, who was, who was a real sour person, and they could they could cause tremendous damage yeah. for an entire country. So, so it was an unstable system. Right. So by by creating democracy, not only did we give em empowerment to grassroots folks. Mm -hmm. We kind of crowdsourced decision making. Okay. Yeah. And, but the way that we could figure out to do it at that point, which we don't have anything better yet, in order to crowdsource decision making, we said we're going to make the questions we ask simple questions. They're going to be yes, no questions, or they're going to be, you know, candidate A or candidate B. Okay. You know? They're binary questions. So there's, there's, there's no gray zone. Yeah. There's no, you know, so, so everything gets boiled down to a yes, no question. When you have a yes, no question, and, and that question ha it has, the result of that has winners and losers, mm -hmm. it divides people into two camps. Seems limited in some ways. It's inherently limited, mm -hmm. and it inherently divides people. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, you create two parties. And the two parties divide the issues up. You'd be for these things, we'll be for this things. Every once in a while they switch, you know, right, like right, right. it's a big deal. Generational realignment. And they switch and 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 then but then they're still just in camps, you know. So right. so and and that simple system which allows us to have elections and initiatives and Robert's Rules of Order for decision making in government bodies. It allows a government body to go through some argumentation and debate mm -hmm. and in a finite amount of time get to a clear answer. It's not quite as good as, as a system as getting to the best answer. Right. And, and so, so in a 200 plus years of American democracy, mm -hmm. we've seen the value of being able to get to an answer. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing the accumulating damage of not getting to the best answer. Right. And so you think these informal discussions that you have in a round table just kind of loosen people <coughs> up and don't make them feel like they're so tribal? Yeah. And, 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 and what can happen, what can happen is if, if we get a bunch of people who all have irons in the fire from different directions, we find a win-win solution together, we can go to the elected officials, mm -hmm. maybe they're elected officials participating, you know, following all the rules for fairness that they have to jump through. Mm -hmm. When we go to the elected officials and, and you know, if, if you support the Republican and you say this is what we should do and I support the Democrat and I say this is what we should do, our, our elected officials, nine times out of ten, are going to be perfectly happy to say, March to the front of the parade and declare victory and right, right, and, and run credit, on it. You know, yeah, and I, yeah, 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 you know, and, yeah. and, is, <laughs> and that's fine. You know, yeah. the, the the important thing is, so if we create consensus in the community, right, if we can get to the best answers for the community, that makes the job of government easy. Yeah, it's sort of like government is not always the best equipped entity to do the job of government. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of the other issues, what other issues, um, so that's your method, and I, I, I kind of get the sense that would be your approach. I, I get the sense that you have a holistic, uh, take a systems approach. Everything, you got the system within systems within systems. I get nervous, um, like I believe in, to a degree, capitalism has its use. Yeah. Um, we do have to have jobs. Uh, I suppose you know we got to we got to figure out how we can support ourselves, sustain ourselves, and sustain this environment. You know, if people could only come from Philadelphia, where I'm from, and get up in a plane 
and travel for the longest distance. You see nothing but a concrete cancer sprawl as far as the eye can see. You have a real appreciation for the way things are set up up out here, you know. And so many of my friends from back east come here and go, wow, this is an awesome place, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. They appreciate it. You yeah. Know? And um, so I get nervous when people say, well, you know, we got to create jobs. we got to have business. we got to do this. And, and they're talking about farming like to like lumber farms you know let's just oh, strip mining and yep. and there's a you know if you just allow people to have jobs and a standard of living everything will shake out in a good way and i'm like well but that's only sounds like a, a, a slanted unsystems type approach let's just do this yeah and i'm like that's just like saying well, okay you got tumors let's just cut off the tumors and we won't deal with the origin of the tumors right so i, I get nervous when i hear that and i you know i'm not saying that uh I understand. I don't. I'm pretty unsophisticated and uneducated, but some things kind of make me a little shaky when I hear a thing. And I know their heart seems like it's in a good place, yep. but I'm like, oh, yep. okay. So I get the sense that's the kind of approach you take on all the issues you're dealing with, whether it's education, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the homeless, mm -hmm. affordable housing. So, t what other things are would you would you want to talk about? Well, so so let's let's jump the shark, you know, and, sure. and we're talking about East Lane County. Okay. And. 90% of Lane County is forest land. Okay. Um, Lane County, in most statistical periods, is the largest saw log producing county and the largest saw log producing state in the country. Okay. In many ways, this is timber central. Okay. It's not an accident that the Oregon Logging Conference is held annually at the Lane County Fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like it all the time when you're in the university town, right. county seat of Eugene, with its you know counterculture reputation and heritage, but this is timber central. So, and the, the timber industry, mm -hmm. which is a shrinking p part of the local economy, but still has a big mind share, and it still mm -hmm. is a very important piece of the landscape. Right. Has a story for people that if we do more logging, it'll bring prosperity back to the the abandoned communities of East mm -hmm. Lane County. And, and the, uh, the, the communities of East Lane County are fascinating because almost every town up the Mackenzie River, up the Middle Fork, mm -hmm. down the Coast Fork, up the Mohawk, the watersheds of East Lane County that together comprise the headwaters of the Willamette River, mm -hmm. almost every one of those little towns is a former mill town. Yes. And but what's happened in the logging, in the timber industry, really just like all other big industries in our country, is it's been mechanized, mm -hmm. automated, and centralized. And so the amount of work, the amount of man hours or people hours that it takes to go from a standing tree in a forest to a timber product ready to ship to a distributor has collapsed. And not you mean only like that, less people? way, okay. way less people. Uh, you know, pr more than an order of magnitude less people. It's a complete revolution. It's happened incrementally, slowly over the last couple of generations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a feller puncher, it's a machine that looks kind of like an excavator with a person in a cab with a joystick and a big arm that mm -hmm. can grab a tree, cut it off, turn it sideways, run it back and forth, cut the limbs off, cut it to a. a measured and computer recorded length and stack it one guy with a joystick in a cab moving through the woods right um, as opposed to crews of loggers right working hard doing hard proud work in the woods mm -hmm. it's still hard proud work in the woods mm -hmm. but but the number of people has just collapsed so so trying to bring prosperity to rural communities by increasing logging is a myth. And, and you can really underline that it's a myth because since the Great Recession, when logging levels went down because the timber prices were down because the housing construction was down, uh, board feet of lumber produced has gone up by a factor of three and employment has barely gone up at all. Mm. And you can look at different time periods and see that that when the, when the timber production goes down, the jobs go down. Right. And when it comes back, a new level of automation and mechanization takes in a new investment in the industry and the jobs 
go mm -hmm. down and down and down. So, so, that, so but at a, at a little bit more general level, um, to get from the economy that we used to have with its boom and bust cycles, we like to remember the boom cycles more than the bust cycles, using up the landscape in an unsustainable way. How do we get to a future which is both prosperous and sustainable? Well, one thing that we should do locally with the timber industry is move from a pure volume orientation to more of a value orientation. So what do you mean by that? An example of that would be to take the forest lands of East Lane County, of Lane County in general, even better over time, gradually Western Oregon. Maybe mm -hmm. we start with the public lands where the public has a direct, the public is the outright owner and has a direct say. Um, and go through a sustainable forest recertification process. Okay. So that lumber, trees that are harvested on our public lands get a higher price because they're green, they're not, not green timber, <laughs> you know, I mean, right, but, right. but because they're, they're environmentally... Um, they're envi uh, environmentally they're, uh, sanctioned areas? Yes. Okay. And they're, they're actually two competing certification systems out there. There's one called SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, I think it is, which is fake. It was created by the timber industry to under, in, undercut the other one. Okay. SFI is a self-certification system. You oh, get the okay. form, yeah. you fill out your exam, yeah. you grade your exam. I love those. You make sure you get an A, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you can print on your packaging. Right. This came from an A grade company. Right. Um, the other one is called FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council. Okay. And, and it's, it's far from perfect, but it does a degree of independent certification and its board includes both industry and environmental entities. Right. And it, it provides um, some basic frameworks of environmentally sensitive operations. Okay. And, and it's the best thing going that we have in okay. forest certification. So, so using a real forest certification system. So have you heard of LEED buildings? LEED. LEED, L-E-E-D. I have not. Um, it's a it's a certification system for green building. Okay. And the city of Eugene several years ago passed a council policy that henceforth any building built by the city of Eugene would be at least a silver level lead certified building. Okay. You know, it goes bronze, I think, or maybe just certified silver, gold, platinum. Okay. Um, with my architecture background and environmental background, I've toured many lead platinum buildings and they're talked about game changers they're really exciting okay. state of the art you know state of the art if you know about energy state of the art comfort natural lighting cuz mm -hmm. if you do it right natural lighting is energy free yeah you know yeah yeah um, and on and on they're they're fantastic things and the rest of the building industry you know sh needs to learn from those and and incorporate those and that's mm -hmm. an ongoing process through updating building codes and so on. And, and for a, a public entity like the city of Eugene to say we're gonna draw a line and do better than that um, is a great thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, when the city of Eugene then turns around and tears down at City Hall and leaves it as a gravel yeah, yeah, gravel it's, yard it's a, it's for, nice for years on end, yeah. that's a failure of that leadership. Yeah. But, but at least they, <laughs> they have the policy of, mm -hmm. they have the words right. So. So when, c and, and a couple of the centers of this lead construction are Seattle and, and San Francisco. Okay. And Portland. The, you know, these are groovy West Coast up and coming, pro you know. These are the cities, cities that practice what you're talking yes. about? Yes. Uh, and a lot of the okay. companies, the uh, high tech companies and other, other high profile flagship companies in these areas want to show their sustainability. Mm -hmm. Values and so they'll build lead high level lead gold silver gold platinum lead buildings. Mm -hmm. In the process of building those buildings, one of the things you, you get it's a point system. Right. And to get a platinum one, you have to have like almost all the points. Right. You know. So and to gold, you have to have at most of the points and right. so on. One of the ways you get points 
is by using FSC sustainably harvested wood. Okay. Another way that you get points is by using materials that have been sourced within a 500 mile radius. Okay. So you're trying oh. to keep the economy local? Is that, yes, is that the thing? and okay. reduce transportation costs right. and energy right. and all that, right? Yeah. All those three of those cities are within 500 miles of Eugene. Mm -hmm. And, and how, much, how much sustainably, how much FSC timber mm -hmm. does green capital Eugene, the county seat of the biggest solid producing county, provide to those green buildings? Virtually none, because we don't have FSC certified timber here. Oh. Okay, so you're going to change that. I think that's that's one of the places to start. Yeah, you yeah. know, and so, so, on each of those problems you talked about, you know, there, 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 there are places that we can make incremental progress. Mm -hmm. and we want to make incremental progress not by doing compromises that hurt us in the long run. You know, we want to see where we're going in the long run, mm -hmm. have honest transparent conversations about where we're headed in the long run, mm -hmm. but find practical common sense ways that we can move piece by piece from here to there. Okay. You know, I was noticing, uh, you know, uh, what you're saying. I didn't know this until I heard your conversation about uh, collapsing workforce, more mechanization, automation, less people extracting lumber. Certainly that would give a savings to the lumber companies. Uh, I do see on my end of it that lumber prices at Home Depot or whatever all places have increased. So if I want to like put new sheeting on my roof, it's like I have to f buy one sheet at a time and wait each week or something. Yeah. So it, 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 you know, I wonder how that could change. I, 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 I seem to read somewhere that your um, that approach of keeping the economy local, mm -hmm. you're also trying to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, encourage people to do more farming in the local area. More. You know, Lane County. In its origins, Lane County produced almost all the food mm -hmm. grown here. The numbers we get now are that Lane County produces about 5% okay. of the food that we eat here. Yeah. We have a wonderful climate. We could produce more of our own food. Yeah. And, and that would keep money in our local economy. Yeah. Um, maybe a more dramatic example is with that, you know, if, if you believe, as I do, that climate change is a real phenomenon, yeah, that yeah, we have, it is. it's an economic risk, and it's also a moral imperative to reduce our emissions, uh, with the United States being yeah. the historical leaders, you know, right. putting the most out. You can look at where our emissions need to be um, in 2050, mm -hmm. 30 years from now. Yeah. And we, among other things, we need to be basically done using fossil fuels as an energy source. Right. And we'll still be having carbon emissions, you know, so that doesn't mean we have zero emissions, but that's one of the things we can see. Well, right now, Lane County spends about a billion dollars a year on buying fossil fuels. Lane County doesn't produce any fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So from a local economy point of view, that's a billion dollars a year we're sending outside our local economy. And then we're transporting it here, which is not good for the environment, right? It's not good for okay. the economy. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, good not for, for the, the three or four gasoline tanker crashes we've had on Highway 58 uh, in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. one of which required hundreds of, hundreds of feet of hot highway to be repaved because it burned enough that it melted the asphalt. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so, so, think of, so put those things together and let's make a win-win. Mm. We have to get to zero. We're spending a billion dollars a year. If we, if we make a countywide, quantitatively verified, quantitatively valid, common sense climate mitigation plan, we will be notching down our fossil fuel use 5% mm -hmm. a year every year. Okay. If you're spending a billion dollars a year and you notch down 5% a year, that's $50 million you save the first year. Nice. The next year you save $100 million. Nice. The next year you save $150 million. Yeah, yeah. Pretty soon million. we're talking real money. Yeah, well, so 50 sounds real to me. But yeah, yeah, $50 million. Going, yeah, yeah, and yeah, think yeah. about it. That that's the, and, and honestly, it sounds kind of wild, but that's exactly what we need to do. Yeah. And you know, that's exactly what the Paris Accord of you know, every country in the world except 
us or we're still in there but we're wobbling mm -hmm. has agreed to do and we're one of the you know if, if we were in North Dakota and the biggest source of, of income to our county was oil and gas production um, we'd have to look harder in the mirror to move in this direction but here in Lane County we can be leaders because it's a pure economic benefit to us. Okay. And yet, we have a county board that doesn't want to take the first baby step to even acknowledge climate change. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand. I just don't understand that situation. I mean, I'm not disagreeing. I, I just don't understand people with that mentality mm -hmm. who just want to put that aside. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested in two other, th I'm interested in everything, that, <laughs> all your issues. You know, we could go hours and hours, but I, two things that concern me, um, one of my passions is uh, I'd like to see affordable housing, especially when you get people who are getting older and in retirement, they can't afford the houses they once paid off. Uh, and then there's the situation with people suffering real financial insecurity or homelessness. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is a daunting problem that needs to be attacked in many different ways. Yep. There's no like, let's just give you money, let's set up some projects and you know, put you in a house you and that's it. There's a lot of things going on there. Yep. What's your thoughts on, on that stuff? Thank you for focusing us on this issue. And thank you for asking that in a way that recognizes that it's not just one big problem. It's, it's, there's some different, different situations within the overall issue of housing affordability. Right. You know, it's, it's defined by the government agencies as affordability for the median income. Right. So, so that's looking at people who are in the middle. Uh, you know, if we have a, a, nor a normal curve of income distribution, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it is. It's, it's a very lopsided curve. No, with more yeah. people at the yeah. bottom. Mm -hmm. but, but it's people who are at, at the average point. Right. Well, if you're working full time, working your ass off at minimum wage, maybe doing a job that's not the most fun and rewarding in the, in the world. Right. You're not making anywhere near, you're making half roughly, a little less mm -hmm. of the average income. Mm -hmm. so, so the government issues about affordability are at the average point, the mm -hmm. way it's, that when, when regular folks talk about it, they're talking, you have to figure out what they're talking about. Right. I think we need to look at that average affordability. We need to look at what happens if you're working full time at minimum wage and what you can afford. And we need to make sure that if you're working full time at minimum wage, there is good, decent housing that you can afford. Mm -hmm. I think that's a responsibility of society. And then you have people who for, for various reasons are incapable of making an income and have zero to a few hundred dollars a month of income. Or none. Yeah, zero. Yeah, right. zero. zero. None, yeah. right? And, and we need to provide housing for people who can't take care of themselves yeah. for, I, for whatever reason. I have um, some friends who are like, uh, I mean, they take capitalism to the extreme in the sense that uh, laissez-faire and, um, you know, just everything will shake out. It's so sad. We shouldn't be spending any money, any tax dollars on some of these people and I you know and they'll cite certain people that we know who are just basically quite honestly they're not mentally ill in a, in a way that most people would recognize or just lazy right who knows what you know who knows right. why but they exist and so they're saying I'm not paying a darn uh, putting out a dime to people like that and you're mm -hmm. like you know and I talked to Chris McAllister and some other people out there in the community who deal with uh, trying to alleviate the homelessness and they go Forget about what personal grudges that some of these people may have against people like this. You got these million dollar Murrays and they just, they just use up so much resources because of the way the system is now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's money and we have limited resources to take care of everybody. So you got women and children who are trying to uh, stay under the radar because they don't want their kids taken away from them. And they could use these resources and this resource is being sucked up by these problem people who just, whatever reason, and um, it would be just cheaper to find a multi-faceted way of taking care of everybody and spend yep. the money on everybody. Yep. And that would just be cheaper. And that would be more money to the people who really want to move forward in society, want to get educated, want to take care of their families, and be a contributing member. Mm -hmm. So 
regardless of personal grudges you have on this one isolated person we could all think about in our family or circle or whatever, mm -hmm. society seems like it would be better if you could save, spend less money mm -hmm. and attend everyone's needs. Yep. I and I'm, I, I really don't know, so I'm going to ask you, is that <laughs> true? I just, well, it just there, seems that way. There, there are a lot of places where Lane County government is being penny wise and pound foolish. Okay. And the lack of basic, minimal, basic housing support mm -hmm. for the poorest people is one of those places. Because I believe, I believe, and I believe that we can afford to put a basic roof over the heads of anybody who wants to come in out of the rain. Right. And and that might be that might be a cement cubicle in a warehouse space. Right. That's bomb proof. Yeah. They can go crazy if that happens and right. they're not gonna cost us much because right. there's practically nothing in there besides yeah. the blanket, you know, for the but but if they have we they deserve to have a place that they can go out of the rain, you yeah. know. We spend so we so you know I, we have a whole sector that works really hard to solve a small fraction of one of the pieces of the affordable housing problem. Right. You know, we have the Egan Warming Centers. Right. And, you know, Pat Farr, County Commissioner, is a big booster of those mm -hmm. and makes speeches about it all the time. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's wonderful that we have a way for people to get inside when it's brutal 25 weather, degrees yeah. out or 29 degrees out or whatever the temperature that they set as a threshold. Yeah. But what about when it's 30 degrees? Mm -hmm. You know, what if, if you have no money, you know, you're not, mm -hmm. not out there in REI mountaineering sleeping bags and tents and stuff. You're out there with whatever scraps haven't gotten lost the last time you got kicked out of the bushes mm -hmm. and it's 35 degrees out and raining. Mm -hmm. You don't get an Egan warming shelter. No. So, from my work in business, um, from my work in in revolutionizing architectural education, from my work in some areas of the internet that led to some big changes, I believe you can, if you focus on solving the whole problem, sometimes you can solve the whole problem just as easily as you can solve 10% of the problem. Yes, thank you, I, I agree with <laughs> you. Know? I, yeah, yeah. You work really hard to do this mm -hmm. and, and create a whole self-sustaining system to mm -hmm. do this, and it's great. I absolutely honor the people who do that because mm -hmm. it's so much better than nothing. Oh, yeah. But it's so, so much smaller yeah. than what we need to do. So let me give an example. So, let, let's so, you know, so one example is I think we need to provide Warehouse type shelter at a basic level mm -hmm. for everybody who needs it. Yeah. Period. Make it cheap. Mm -hmm. Let's get it done in a couple years. Mm -hmm. Let's just do it. You know, I when I when I first got out of the Marines, and of course, uh, some people would argue that's um, uh, many servicemen would be homeless uh, when they're young and unschooled and so forth. They warehouse. They warehouse. Mm -hmm. Warehoused us. Yeah. And so you had a community uh, place to eat. You just one room. You, sometimes you shared that room with four guys. Mm -hmm. A community shower. It wasn't optimal. You yeah. couldn't bring a, a girl home with you. You know, uh, at least you weren't supposed to. <laughs> and, and and the fact of the matter is, is that when I first got out, I was um, a high school dropout. I I willingness to work, love working, but very little skills. So I was not very marketable. And then uh, you know, when you have one, you're working two janitorial jobs, and that crashes, and you don't plan well. And the next thing you know, you're on the streets. And so I would have been happy to be put in a warehouse and say, here's some gruel, here's some beans and rice, here's yeah. a blanket. You could work around here. I would have been like, oh my gosh, it'd be great because you could work up from there, right? You have a, you know. Exactly. So, so I, I, I mean, I would have been happy for that. And it would be nice to uh, have people in my situation say, well, you can't afford school, but especially now with the internet, now you have access to all this education yep. for free. Yep. And that would be, that would be awesome. Yep. And so, because I've gone through uh, some stints of financial insecurity, and I've had a lot of people that I've known the same thing, I've, I take a big interest in examining all these different levels. And I'm going, you know, what you're saying is true. It wouldn't be that much harder, if harder at all, right. to just acknowledge the different levels that people are at and say, okay, this program would be better for you, this program. And in the, in the entirety, from what I've seen, 
would be cheaper than just like doing things the way they're done now. Carting people in and out of the emergency room all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, while their while they, while their life while their their health falls apart. Right. And we they we do nothing to protect. You know, it's it's kind of like like if you had a car. You know, you're yeah. trying to take care of your car. Yeah. You would leave it with the windows rolled down. You mm -hmm. know, out in the middle of a bad neighborhood. Right. And then. And then every once in a while, you'd go pick it up and you'd take it to the body shop and, and fix up what you could. And then you'd put it back to be into the, yeah, into the yeah. stripping area. You yeah, know? yeah. It, that's what we do with people. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and aside from the fact that it's cruel and there's a huge amount of suffering, which are fundamental, mm -hmm. but just on the economic level. Just that, just that alone. And it's yeah. penny wise and pound foolish. Yeah, I, and if yeah. we make it no frills, because I, you know, I, I, have, I have a lot of Republican supporters people who, who believe in our current president, mm -hmm. who, and we talk about some of these issues, mm -hmm. and we agree that we believe in helping people who are truly needy. Yeah. And we agree that we don't want to give handouts to people who are freeloaders and right, lazy. Right, right. Um, so, so that's the common ground for the conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe there's a way that if we, we do this kind of Base level housing, that is pretty no frills. Yeah. Not it's not 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 fun. Right. You know. Right. Then people who are needy will be grateful to not be out on the streets, mm -hmm. and people who are lazy will not be freeloading of anything of, of value. Right. You know? And they'll always find sympathetic people to uh, whatever. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know. can find an anecdote to yeah. justify almost anything. Right. And that uh, arguing by anecdotes is powerful because of the storytelling, human right. drama of it, but it's it's shaky in terms of making public policy in the big picture. Right. That's why I think the dollars and cents when I've you know because uh, I got a couple <laughs> friends who are really sympathetic to uh, women and children and who wouldn't be. Yeah. But when they and they so they'll point to this other person um, you know the other people that we know and I'm like Okay. Yes, I understand. You would like to see them, you know, rolled up in a dirty tarp out there in the cold because you, you're pissed off at them. But the fact is, it's costing these people over here who don't deserve that. You, are you going to like just just for whatever yeah. some personal weird vendetta yeah. to try to say I don't want to see this person get over whatsoever because they're lazy, and and these people are going to be costing for it. Right. And and oh, society, the ta it'll cost us and you exactly. and me more. So I'm just saying, let's look at it from a, a dollar and cents point yep. of view, at least, and, you know. And 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 maybe people are skeptical about that. So then we have one of these big conversations where we get people with different viewpoints and mm -hmm. skepticism, mm -hmm. and we go through the numbers, mm -hmm. and maybe we take six months or a year, mm -hmm. meeting regularly, going through the numbers. Mm -hmm. You show me yours numbers. I'll show you my numbers. We'll talk them through, and and we'll f and we will find a common basis. And then we will, that group of people together mm -hmm. will have a shared answer to the question, mm -hmm. is it cost effective? You know, how many of, what, are the pre freeloaders 1% yeah. or 5% yeah, it's or 50%? Yeah, it's speculation. Because you get, you get a lot of people who go down to the, uh, the bike path that go, well, I just know that the bulk of the population are free to floating. I'm like, well, you don't know that, right, really. Right. You know, that's just a perceptual thing. You see, maybe that perception, maybe those people along that bike path, maybe. Yeah. But what about the people you don't see who are like um, embarrassed or f afraid or hiding or yeah. trying to protect themselves or out looking for work? Or maybe there are some of the, I met a lot of homeless who are they're called the working homeless. Mm -hmm. They yeah, I mean they're sharp. They keep themselves groomed and they got nice clothes, and they just can't afford to live in an apartment. Right. So they just face, you know. That's so getting into that people. that that minimum wage right benchmark in the housing right. affordability. You know, and, uh, to jump to a different part of that bigger housing affordability picture, sure. just to to indicate the kind of things that I look for. Um, and this would be relevant to people on fixed incomes, like you talked about, somebody who had a bought a house, mm. paid it off, they're living there on a fixed income, um, most of their expenses are creeping up faster than their income is, including right. their property taxes. Right, right. And like a couple um, I talked to in those, the, the um, kind of mill worker houses mm. off of 18th and the flats out in West, West Eugene, Right. Um, they bought their house for 
$19,200 in uh, in this early 70s. Yeah. And now they're they've been they're they're pretty elderly. They're still in good health. They're getting more and more frail, but they've been on fixed incomes for 20 years. They've right. been watching that that sh get that p pincer move on them. Mm -hmm. And their taxes are $3,400 a year and yeah. going up. Yeah. Utilities so, going up, property taxes yeah. going up, everything yeah. going up. So, and, and it's a particular issue in Oregon because we rely on property taxes for a big chunk of our taxation right. model. Right. Um, so, one th so one thing that I think we should fight for in Oregon, and I would like to see the county board do a public study of and then become an advocate for, is something called a homestead property tax exemption. It's actually something that is already in place in more than 40 states. Really? And you, it's because it's simple and it undoes some of the regressive nature of the property tax system. Mm -hmm. You basically you have to figure out you know, the numbers, but you take a set amount, call it $50,000, mm -hmm. and the first $50,000 of everybody's property tax assessment is tax-free. Okay. So if you're living in a little shack out in the woods and your property with the land and everything is valued at $60,000, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying One -third. property taxes on 60000 minus 50 oh, on, right, on, right, on $10,000. Right, okay, right. Yeah. And if you're living in a $950,000 McMansion, you're going to be paying property taxes on $900,000. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a dead simple calculation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very transparent, mm. um, but it goes directly to help the people who have already downsized their lives or, or right-sized their lives yeah. to a low income level, who are homeowners, who are responsible members of society, yeah. um, who need a break. Yeah, because a lot of these older people, I mean, maybe they're in good health, maybe not, maybe, you know, not only um, are all other uh, costs have gone up like uh, utilities and food and um, everything. Uh, some of these people, as they get older, they have like more medical bills mm -hmm. and more prescriptions yep. and so forth. So yep. they're getting hammered from every angle. Yep. And, and of, know, cor of course, doing something about our crazy healthcare system will help everybody in affordability spectrum. Right. You know, uh, the one of the largest, if not the largest, cause of personal bankruptcy mm -hmm. is medical problems. Yeah. So one of the causes of people getting pushed out of their houses yeah. and even becoming homeless is medical problems yeah. when um, every other well-to-do country mm. understands that just like if you and I saw a sick person there and we had a way to help them, mm -hmm. we would want to help them. Yeah. And every decent human being in the country feels that way on a personal basis. Yes. And yet our country is organized so that we have to check that person's wallet and see if it's plump or not before we decide whether <laughs> yeah. to help them. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I I'm striving for um, as a, I, I do personal training in my retirement years. You know, I've had an interest in personal training, nutrition, and the one thing that is uh, irrefutable is that 60 percent, 60 some percent of our uh, diseases and medical problems prior to the age of 60 mm -hmm. is basically um, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, uh, to add insult to injury, uh, a lot of people don't understand what's the right lifestyle because you got these different government agencies, all high carb, high this, you know, that, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, my job is to, uh, what I'd like to see is to ed see people educated without using tax dollars, if, if, if could be, but um, saying, hey, you know, um, encourage them to maybe give them some sort of payback or some sort of uh, discount on their insurance premiums or whatever. Okay, you're working out, you're doing this, you're reading right, you're checking in every now and then, and uh, so you're keeping away from the different various activities that would impair your health. It's, it's kind of perverse to see people spending a lot of money on cigarettes and alcohol. I'm going to invest all this money in the deteriorating my health. Yep. And so, but that's an educational, cultural thing, I think, just to get people to change. So that's that's yeah. That would that would that would that would minimize the need yep. for the success of excessively expensive health care. And regardless of whether you you know you believe that we should all pay into it and have everybody have access to paid health care or not, I just I would like to see 
that sort of mindset promoted. But I do, I, we, you know, we got to do something because there are a lot of people, um, you know, th even if they don't require hospitalization, if the, um, if you're forced out of work just because you're too much pain and too ill mm -hmm. to get out of your house yep. most of the time, it's just tough. Yep. So. And and people get into a downward spiral because mm -hmm. if you you know there's a there's a it's pretty well understood that there's a basic level of daily physical activity that helps keep you healthy. Yes. And if you get below that, your health is going to deteriorate. Yeah. And then it's going to be hard even to do that oh. physical activity. Oh, yeah. So something as simple as using the stairs mm -hmm. can help people, right? Sure. So let's do more as a society mm -hmm. in helping people use stairs. Yeah. How many buildings are you in with an elevator where you can't find the stairs? Right. That's part A. Part right. B, you find the stairs, but they are gloomy mm -hmm. and even scary if you're if you're not, you know, a, a fit man right, trained right. in right. self defense, <laughs> right, right? Right. You know? And you know, so 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 let's let's ask for our buildings to be some of you know, some of it is just personal habits, but we right. can help with signage. Sure. We can help with how entrances are, mm -hmm. are organized. You know, there's a new building downtown. I can find the stairs. When I come out the stairs, mm -hmm. the only place they come out is in the middle of the parking garage. And the only place out of the parking garage is out the back of the building. So I come in the lobby, I go up the stairs, I'm in the building, I come down, and I get pushed out the back. Oh, okay. You know, because it, it, it's, it's the, the stairs, the most, the cheapest way to build the stairs in a multi-story building is just to meet the fire code. Ah. And so developers and architects and builders focus on the fire code requirements. And by defining it that way, we've pushed the stairs into the back corner. Okay. Metaphorically. Yeah. You know, so that's just, that's like, you know, a, a little example of how, I mean, so related to that, um, we just like we have these penny wise pound foolish problems, we also have these individual breakdowns that are part of the system breakdown. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the physical activity level, individuals who have their wits about them and have enough health and and a time and so on to be able to make their own way can find a way to take 10,000 steps a day. Yeah. But we don't design our cities so that people take 10,000 steps a day. Mm. We design our cities so that you take as few steps as possible. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to be healthy, you have to take your 10,000 steps as an add-on right. somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So having a really good mass transit system mm -hmm. that has frequent stops all over allows people to leave their cars at home or mm -hmm. to not have a car right. and move around the metropolitan area. Like in Amsterdam, I remember when I was there. So it was so cool the way they had that set up. Yeah, yeah. And how fit is the average Dutch person compared to the average American? Uh, they're beautiful looking people. They're <laughs> fit. They're, yeah, they are. They're very fit. And, it, and it's... And it's and a lot of that is because the system is built that way. Right, right. Yeah, I um, I I just uh, I would like to see uh, more of what you're talking about. The, just so um, I'm rambling now because I had a thought that just <laughs> kind of went off, but uh, um, I can't even bring it back. Do you Anyways, have another? How are we doing on time here? We're, we're actually out of time. So okay. give us give us a, so you have a friends for uh, Kevin Matthews. Uh, yeah, my website for my campaign mm -hmm. is uh, www.friendsofkevinmatthews.org. Right. Okay. Two T's in Matthews. Okay. And we we have a, a grassroots, people-driven campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we've phoned individually, personally phoned, mm -hmm. or knocked on the door of something like 25,000 people at this stage in the campaign. Mm -hmm had conversations with many, many thousands of voters, and we have thousands of supporters. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking here today, we're uh, less than two weeks from election day. Yeah. People's ballots for the 
May 2018 primary election have to right. be in by 8 p.m. on May 15th. Okay. Oh, what, uh, I finally remembered what I was going <laughs> to supposed to say. I just basically, uh, when you get into office, uh, or any of you guys get into office, all when you all get into office at different levels, um, some of my elderly friends and I, we're talking about uh, not just for the elderly, but uh, um, find some way where individuals and families can incorporate and get to some of the tax deductions that corporations have. I'd like to see all my food and supplements taken off the top. So, like, if I make sixty thousand a year and I spend ten thousand yeah. on taxes uh, on, on food, yeah. I'd like to be taxed on fifty thousand. <laughs> That's all. You know, little, little things like that. And then, of course, with these biometric machines and devices that basically check out uh, your your heart rate, the Fitbits, you know, maybe monitor your blood sugar, your ketones, and all that. And, monitor what you're eating, finding some way for insurance companies to go, you know, you're doing everything right, let's really cut down your premiums. Little things like that. Uh -huh. But that's, I'm kind of a geek about that sort uh -huh. of stuff. But anyways. Good ideas. It's been, it's been great talking to you. It's a pleasure. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a great time, right? Okay. So check Kevin Matthews out for Friends for Kevin Matthews.